Let us pray. The uh, saints of God gathered today to proclaim you as Lord and God in our thoughts, words, and actions. And when we go astray, we thank you for your word that corrects us, rebukes us, challenges us, changes us, and restores us in the direction that we should go. May your word speak to us as it rebukes us. May your word encourage us in the directions that we should go. May your word comfort and strengthen us. Help me to disappear and you appear in and through me. And this we pray through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, saints. Good morning. Response is good morning, saintly father. Good morning, saintly father. Hey, you may not see it. You may not recognize it. If you are called to see Christ in somebody, and that is the essence of sainthood to see Christ in somebody and to be able to portray Christ in ourselves. And today, welcome to the celebration of All Saints and All Souls Sunday in the church liturgical calendar. November 1st is All Saints Day, and November 2nd is All Souls Day. And as the words depict, All Saints Day is when we remember the saints who have gone by and who have played a part in the life of the church. Certain Christians in history have been identified and honored as saints with specific days to remember them. You know, in the Roman Catholic tradition, to declare a person a saint is called a canonization, and it's a wrong process of verification identification, verification, and in eventually the institution. In the Anglican Church, and normally these saints are already dead, and then you declare them as saints. In the, Ang in the Anglican Church, you first make them canons, and then you gradually make sure they die. The purpose of sainthood is at the end of the day declaring Christ as Lord. But then, well, how do we reconcile that with Hebrews passage that say, declares, Paul declares us as the sainthood of all believers. So, in that sense, all of us make contributions to the kingdom, to the Christian faith, to the growth of the church in our own simple ways, sometimes unrecognized, unsung. Nobody knows. And there are more of those than the ones who have been identified. Hence, 
All Saints Day to recognize all those who have made a contribution to the life of the church and the history of the church and have not been recognized. All Saints Day, we honor those heroes of the church, known and unknown. We do not worship them. Let's not make a mistake in thinking that we worship them. We do not worship them, but we honor them. The witnesses and prayers of the past, present, and the future make up our sainthood. Witnesses of the past, present, and future. Because we stand in the presence of a God who is the Alpha and the Omega. And in between, his time is not ours. His seasons are not ours. In between, these multitude of the faithful saints, past, present, and future, come together to worship God. Their witnesses gives us fresh inspiration. It gives us new life to participate with God in his mission and ministry. You remember the story of going up to the mountain to pray with Jesus. And then suddenly appeared with Jesus who? Elijah and Moses. And then after the encounter, after the experience, and after Jesus was lifted up, an immediate reaction of Peter was, let's make three booths and let's hang around here. The past, the present have come together in one place. And there was a certain sense of awe oh, because God of the past and the present came in one place. And indeed, the God of the future, because through Jesus came the rest of our believers. And you and I are sitting here today because of that third person who was in that, on that mountain. The past, the present, and the future coming together in the presence of God, who is timeless, the Alpha and the Omega. It is a combined witness of the saintly dead and the saintly living. Sometimes we just need to look within ourselves and recognize our own. Just remember, those who have come through our lives as individuals, as families, and they did a saintly thing, a saintly thing in our lives. And once in a while, just remember them. Don't forget them. And it's not about lifting them up beyond what you are supposed to do, but it is through them remembering the grace of God. It is through them remembering God's graciousness to us. As a diocese and cathedral, I normally would like to remember on this day, with much gratitude, the life and contributions of the bishops of this diocese. John Edward Hine, Alston James Wallace May, Robert Selby Taylor, Francis Oliver Green Wilkinson, Philemon Mataka, Stephen Steve Sebastian Mumba, Leonard Jameson Mwenda, David Job. And each one of them played a certain part in the building up of this diocese, of the church in Zambia. 
and some of the things that we enjoy today, we are riding on their legacy up to now. Each one had a specific role to play and in times when you can't even remember how did they even manage to do the things they did. Just try and remember how they built the cathedral in Msoro or the church in Chipili or the times they went to the different mission stations, Fivila, Mapanza, and built those structures and communities because it was not about structures, about the communities they built at times when we can't even imagine how this would have happened. Each one had a contribution to make. If we sit here to analyze each one, it will take us days. Each one is a, if you are a student of church history, you can write a thesis on each one of them. There is enough of their contributions. I just want to remember one or two, those I remember myself. One is uh, Robert Selby Taylor, who was uh, made bishop in Likoma Island and eventually came and became bishop here. And he's the one who set up a whole lot of things that we actually benefit from today. He is the one who set up all the theological colleges that we know. Some were open, they survived, and then they were closed when they, it was not, no longer necessary. But there isn't one theological college that was not initiated, opened, financed, or built by him, including the current St. John Seminary in Kitwe. After retiring as, as Bishop of, Archbishop of Cape Town, he came back to serve in Zambia, in central Zambia, as during my time there as my bishop. And I remember, came back from retirement to serve, and that's the time he built and established St. John Seminary. But he is the one who, while they were beginning to establish the church in Zambia and in Lusaka, was a visionary steward. You know, stewardship comes in different ways. Some stewardship is about visionaries. If you have a vision and you do something about it, you will see the net effect in due season. You won't see the full results, but visionaries are called to get things going. And Robert Selby Taylor went and paid a deposit for a piece of a farm that was being sold, a piece, not the whole farm. And of course, when I say he went and paid a deposit, it is his own money, family money. There was no church money. He went and paid a deposit, and that farm eventually got subdivided, and his part in which, for which he had paid the deposit was ready for sale. And the owner called him one day and said, are you not the one who paid the deposit? He even forgot about it. Are you interested in getting it? Come with the rest of the money, and the property is yours. He quickly put the rest of the money together, went, paid the farmer, and bought that piece of land. That is what you see today in Kabalonga as Bishop's Road. On one side of Bishop's Road, you have the school, the, the next property, which is uh, now Council of Churches, up to the next road. The Council of Churches was our seminary at one point until the next road. The other side of the Bishop's Road, starting from the petrol station, Central Mall, all the way to the next road, 
and behind, which is called Martin Luther King Road, is what he paid for. Did he know that it was going to become a commercial center, the most lucrative piece of land in Kabalonga? No. Because he was a visionary, a steward who was entrusted with a vision and he planted it. He never saw what it became. Everybody has been given that stewardship investment within themselves. And it is up to us to bring out the sainthood in us. Because what he did is for the kingdom. When you do things for the kingdom, you see the sainthood emerging from us. Similarly, there are so many others. Each one had a role to play. Francis Oliver Green Wilkinson is, this cathedral is because of him. We are sitting in this cathedral because of his initiative. Even the first 500 pounds, which came from, two 500 pounds, which came from Canterbury and another one from the royal family. Why the royal family? His father was a chaplain, a royal chaplain to the royal family, one of the chaplains. He influenced the royal family to put an investment into the kingdom in Zambia, in Lusaka. And from that little amount started growing. I mean, of course, in the 1950s, 500 pounds was a lot of money. And so it began to grow into what you see today with other people coming in, selling cakes, doing all kinds of things to raise money to build this cathedral. But visionary stewardship. Somebody who saw way beyond where they were. And these are the people that we celebrate and because of whom we are here. I want to also mention some we know of late, Bishop David Njovu. His passion and compassion for a program that he suddenly saw life in and his life was given for it and indeed he gave his life at the end for the cause of malaria elimination. His last trip was an assignment in Solways and died while he was attending a meeting. Different people have been given different visions at certain seasons in life and we run with it. And hence the stewardship that we celebrate today is indeed the stewardship established by the saints who have gone before us and who are still here with us. We also remember the deans of Lusaka, Alfred Webster Smith, Patrick Robert Norman Appleford, Louis Weatherby Pitt, Charles John Kleiberg, Peter Graham Edwards, Pierre Dill, David Njou. Apart from one, I was in touch with all the rest at some point or the other. And among this is Patrick Robert Norman Appleford, who died not very long ago. Many of the hymns that we sing in that red hymn book was written by him. He was dean of this cathedral at one point. And he, in his poetic language, in his poetic gifting, he coined and wrote those hymns which are sung today 
across the world from this ancient and modern hymn book. People who are gifted in a particular way, contributing to the kingdom and its growth. Many of these, I, I remember coming here and meeting Louis Pitt, who was dean here, but then before he went to Harare in 77. Everybody played a part in building on those things that other saints have left for us. We build on what others have established for us. May what God did and is doing through his saints living and dead bring glory to his name. And so today we reflect on the stewardship of the saintly dead and the saintly living. The saintly led, dead, saints of the past, present, and future will gather as Revelation passage teaches us, rescued by divine mercy during the tribulation. They are the 144,000 of the saved Jews of the 12 tribes of Israel gathered from across the world. Some scholars say it is not about a number, 144,000, but it is about the com completeness and the inclusiveness of the whole tribe of Israel. They will one day see and know the mistake they made in the rejection of Christ and turn and realize and recognize the Savior who passed by them and they did not see. And so when that happens, this number will be identified. And you also know in hi history right now, the Jewish the state of Israel have a department that searches for the Jews scattered. From the roots, they were scattered through various historical seasons, and when they were scattered across the world, you don't even know where all they went. And so, they have a department that traces. You have to actually prove the connection all the way back to the roots of the Jewish tradition, the Hebrew tradition. And they were amazed that certain groups, 2,000 years, and they never lost that tradition. Hence you see the Falashas of Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Jews who were collected and who were gathered and taken back to Israel. And from different parts of the world, you find not far from where I come from, a synagogue that was set up in early 2000 years ago. Today, all the Jews have moved to Israel since 1947 when the state was established, but the synagogue is still there and there was one family left looking after the synagogue. Eventually, they also went, leaving the synagogue as a national monument. Recently, I was reading that a whole tribe or people were identified in the northeast, in the northeast of India, who look like Chinese, but this tribe have been maintaining the Jewish tradition for the 2,000 years. In the middle of nowhere, and they have been gathered together, and they have been now migrated back to Israel. So the gathering is happening. This verse is for real. And a great multitude, the next verse says, of Gentiles, that's you and us, from every ethnic group, geographical area, every part of the world, 
will gather together. And we will have one common agenda. We will be coming to the Lamb of God. Some, as the Bible says, may have paid a great price of death for their testimony. Somebody in many parts of the world today, those who claim their faith in Christ is not as simple as we celebrate here. They are persecuted and they are killed. Their churches are burned. And you will still see them standing on a Sunday right across the road from one end for miles and miles and says, church building is gone. But the church of Christ stands here today. You can't take that spirit away from them. Persecuted, forgotten, but not eliminated. They will continue. And everywhere in the world where such persecution has happened, you will see them emerging in these last days. Some indeed have paid a great price for their faith. But they cry out together, no matter from where, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. In one voice, the 144,000 and the Gentiles will one day come together to proclaim this truth. To become part of the saintly dead, we must now be part of the saintly living. It is more easy to be a saintly dead than a saintly living because we have to live with others. The saintly living are a creation of God. It's a creation of God through the provision of the new or renewed covenant as we read in Jeremiah. The saintly living can only live a saintly life with this transformation. That is a new heart and a new spirit given by God to his people. The old covenant saints were guided by the law. By the law. And sometimes when I reflect upon the events of the last few weeks in Israel and elsewhere. What is to be guided by the law? An eye for an eye. A hand for a hand. In this case, one eye for 20 eyes. The justice of what you see is that there is no justice in this order. How Israel reacts of late to conflict, I believe, is an eye for an eye concept. And you begin to wonder, what has gone wrong? While the new covenant is God putting the Spirit in us to practice the new commandment. And what is the new commandment? Love one another. Love one another. What's the difference? Christ. There is no, Christ is not a criteria in the Jewish faith. That's the difference between us and them. We recognize the Messiah and we accepted him. They still are waiting for the Messiah. They are still waiting for the Messiah. And so Christ has not been integrated with their faith. 
that believes. This new heart and new mind operating under the guidance of the Spirit of God is the sainthood of all believers. That is the sainthood of all believers. Allowing the Spirit of God to operate within us so that when you want to retaliate, something will tell you, hold on. So where do we go to? You go to the passage we read, the passage, the gospel we read this morning. The saintly living are called to a new way of life. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 is not the way to salvation. The way of salvation, it is not. But the way of righteous living, it is a way of righteous living for the saintly living. If you want to live as a saint in the Christian faith, then this is the guidance or guidelines given to us by Jesus himself. It is about maintaining a right relationship with God, others, and ourselves. And so when you go through the, the Beatitudes, as it's called, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, there's one verse, blessed are the meek, verse 5, for they shall inherit the earth. If you wanted to inherit the land, if you want to possess it, then you are called to be meek. And meekness is not weakness. It's not weakness. It is power under control. It is power under control. You know you are right. You know they have done the wrong thing and I am on the right side. You know I have the right to strike back. Because the person said these things about me. The person has done this to me. I have the right to strike back because I am on the right. But I will not. But I will not. And that is meekness. It is not a submission that I have failed. It is not a submission that I give up. It is knowing that I am in control. I have the authority. I have the power to finish off all these countries around me. I have the power. But I will not. Because my power is greater when I don't. Than when I do. I am more powerful when I don't strike back than when I strike. That is meekness, power under control, and you will inherit, says the word. I wish people would shift their mindset into this peacemaking meekness-oriented mindset. It seeks the meek, the merciful, the pure, the peacemaker. What a contrast between Matthew chapter 5, which God wants us to live in his kingdom, and what we see around us today. It is about the practice of mercy, justice, and peace. And that's why the Old Testament also says, I do not want your sacrifices. What I want is for you to practice mercy, justice, and peace. It is about one being innocent until proven guilty. It is not about punishing the guilty, but more about the innocent not being punished unjustly. If you have the guilty and the non-guilty in one place, 
And because your eyes are on the guilty and you punish the guilty and in the process you also punish the innocent. That is great injustice according to our teaching. That is great injustice and that is the way we understand the law. Today's law is based on these principles. Even if you punish, don't punish a guilty person. God forbid that you should punish an innocent person. It seeks the meek, the merciful, the pure, the peacemaker. I ask myself, if Jesus was the king of Israel, Today, what would he have done? The one who gave us Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. What would he have done in that situation? In God's standards, all have fallen short of the glory of God. God's standards. Dear saintly living, let us transform our saintly lives with a new heart and a new mindset, a new spirit, and be able to stand before the throne of God and say, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. May the life and times May the life and times of the saints past and present May the life and times of the saints gone before us and living with us the stewardship of the saints gone before us and who live with us, inspire us all to be good stewards of what God has invested in us. Invested in us as we discover the vision, the purpose, the plans, the resources, and everything God has given us. May God help us indeed to practice living sainthood in today's world in the midst of all our challenges. For what we have been able to do, build on those who have gone before us, one brick, just one brick. May God bless those hands that add on value to what is left in our hands. May God help us to leave a legacy for those who come after us, creating the opportunity for them to practice what God has given them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.